The other thing that we learned was you have to live and breathe it in every part of your business, every decision you make, every communication you have, because people pick up all the little bits. So if, if you're not living and breathing it, if it all starts from the top and then it starts from the leaders and it goes on the way down. Hey Tribe, Stephanie Dixon here for Green is a New Black TV, your guide to conscious living in Asia. Today we are shooting with a fellow Australian, Justin Dry, the co-founder and joint CEO of Vino Mofo. We're going to be diving into how a digital wine company is taking over the market. We're also going to be looking at how to keep your company culture growing strong as you grow and also looking about wine for good. Justin, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's exciting to be here. Yeah. Uh, so let's take it back to the beginning. You know, how, why, and, and you know, exactly how was it all put together? And tell us a little bit about the name of Vino Mofo as well. My ancestors planted some of the first vines in the Bross Valley. Um, so they're some of the oldest vines in the world, actually. From there, I had family in the industry. Um, they were teaching me about wines when I was a teenager, you know, before I even drank wine. I was having like at Christmases and 14, I had like my uncles who were like quite well known viticulturists and stuff, right? Wrote a lot of textbooks for uni, um, giving me blind tastings of wine. They would do like, um, I want you to pick vintage, region, variety. And I'd be like, how the hell am I supposed to do this? But they would guide me through it. And I think that, the history, um, kind of got me super interested. So I ended up studying wine at uni. And then I worked in the industry. And what happened, there was this moment in time which um, kind of drove, I guess, the philosophy behind the first couple of businesses plus Vino Mofo, which is removing the bow ties and the VS and the imitation around wine, which was, um, and that was born out of me being this little wine nerd at like 23 years old. As a wine nerd, you go to independent wine shops and look for like interesting small batch kind of wines. And I was going into these shops at 23, going, oh, I want to find something, you know, really kind of special from, you know, North West Italy or Burgundies or you know just something interesting and kind of higher end that they don't have at the commercial places and I remember walking into all these independent stores and there was this like always this guy with like a shirt on and rosy cheeks and a bow tie and he, he seemed to it just was such an intimidating environment mm -hmm. and I, I was thinking to myself as a 23 year old with this much experience could you imagine how everyone else feels and so I was like this is all full of shit and we've got to do something about democratizing wine um, and opening it up to the younger generation and so it's not intimidating for them they can experience this wonderful thing that we are so passionate about which is wine. I had a few unsuccessful businesses <laughs> um, between then and Vino Mofo. Um, we had uh, something called Quaff which was like a social website for wine. I traveled through South America, got onto Facebook very early and we kind of stayed in touch with Facebook and I was like, ah, oh, that's really interesting. I want to get into the online space. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna do the Facebook for wine. Um, it didn't work. And so we built this really strong tribe of young wine lovers. And then we pivoted that model because we weren't making any money and we started some, an online wine truffle show called Road to Vino. Uh, Road to Vino was um, us, Andre and, my, and myself, Andre is my brother-in-law and co-founder, traveling around the countryside in a combi. Um, filming us or someone filming us and recording us visiting all these amazing wine producers around the country. Mm -hmm. And eventually, about four or five years after starting our first online one, um, Vino Mofo was born and that's the one that just took off. And um, touching on the name thing, it was originally going to be called Vino Mojo. So Vino Mojo, get your mojo working. So, get, you know, so Vino means wine, get your mm -hmm. uh, mojo, get your mojo working. And we kind of liked it. Um, and we did this whole kind of pre-launch campaign, had our social pages done, our website with a countdown. This is where it was launching. Two days out from launch, we get a cease and desist um, from a solicitor from a big public company. They had a wine called Mojo Wines. Mm -hmm. And it was in a different category, obviously, because we're an online retailer, they were a wine brand. And I don't think you can get those things confused very easily, but um, the, the law, the, the letter said from the lawyer, um, we're gonna get an injunction to stop you trading. Um, wow. Yeah, if you don't change the net. So we, being not cashed up at that stage, called our really cheap solicitor. <laughs> and said, what do we do? And they, and they said, um, change the name. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, cracked. Um, but what they did say was, you will win this because it's in a different category and it's different enough anyway. But because you haven't traded, and they have, because of that, they would be able to go to court, get the judge to stop us trading or launching until they'd heard the case. 
Mm. And that case could be like six months or 12 months. And the reality was the market was ripe for what we were going to do. And we didn't want anyone to beat us to the market. Absolutely. So what we did is what we usually do when we have big issues, we open a couple of bottles of wine. We were playing around with the name of you know, Vino Moto, Vino Modo. And then after like two bottles of wine, <laughs> um, I sat there and went, oh, no, why don't we call it Vino Mofo for the motherfuckers that are trying to steal our mojo? And we're like, Ooh, uh, and we kind of laughed a bit and we're like, oh, we can't, it's so rude, but, and it's so crass, um, but maybe we can, it'll be a funny story. Um, and eventually we settled on the fact that we'd do it for a little bit of time. So it's like vino mofo, so it's like wine motherfuckers. I think it's really clever that in the end it worked out and these things are always meant to be. So even though it was probably painful at the time, you got those bottles of wine out and yeah. that, those creative juices were flowing. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I think it's just one, you know, it's one of those lucky things because yeah. it's made us stand out far more than Vino Mojo would have. And it feels more kind of connected to us and, yeah. and our brand kind of tone. So. Absolutely. So when you first started, you know, you were entering a really big industry, a really old industry, and you guys were disruptors. You were doing something fresh, new, and using digital. So a big part of the pressure you were receiving from the big boys, you said, let's build our tribe, let's get the numbers. So how did you really focus on building that tribe and doing it so quickly? Because if you look after the initial, um, uh, the initial community, they become brand ambassadors and they tell all their friends and it's that people networking effect. And I know people talk about it a lot now, because even when we come to places like new markets like Singapore or New Zealand, we're about to go to America, um, we start grassroots, ground up, startup communities, wine and food scene, um, one-on-one -on -one relationships to one-on-five to one-on-fifty to one-on-a-hundred and it's really super important to us and we believe those relationships are the most important thing. The fact that we had to scale so quickly at some point was because the big guys didn't like what we were doing to the industry because we were skipping all the middlemen. We, got, we went from producer to consumer and we were the only person in the middle and traditionally it's like wholesalers, distributors and agents, import, export. It's, it is so ludicrous how many hands touch a bottle of wine and uh, they didn't like that because there's a lot of money to be made in between. Yeah. And instead of taking all those margins, we just pass it on to the consumer, which meant that we were selling wines at prices no one could compete with. And so you won a lot of incredible awards, which is just amazing. So just to name a few, you know, best online retailer, but also best employer, best startup and best staff engagement. Mm -hmm. So I think that those really stood out for me because I was like, OK, obviously cool brand, but actually the staff love working there as well. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about your culture, firstly, and then secondly, how you are able to grow the culture as you're growing all the stuff, how can you actually maintain what you've built? For us, it was two people in a garage. <laughs> it was the founders. We had no office, no other people. We did everything. And I think you, or you are the culture at that stage. When you then introduce five or 10 people, uh, you're still such a huge part of it. So you still have so much influence. You hear every conversation. You're part of every meeting. You get to 20, 30 people, um, and you're still in the same room. But, but the influence is starting to become a little bit smaller because people are having their own meetings, their own conversations with outside. And so I think that starts, that's kind of that point where you start going, oh, we need to actually kind of get this in a place where it's easy to communicate and live by. Um, and when you then hit 50 and 100, like at 100, we're 2% of the people. You know, we've got 130 odd people now uh, at Vino Mofo. We're literally like less than 2% of yeah. the team. So in order to do that, we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. One, we can't control the culture anymore. So mm -hmm. you need to pass the expectation, responsibility, um, education to leads. And those, so those leads have got to be the people that then bring it down to their teams. The other thing that we learned was you have to live and breathe it in every part of your business, every decision you make, every communication you have, because people pick up all the little bits. So if, if you're not living and breathing it, if it all starts from the top mm -hmm. and then it starts from the leaders and it goes on the way down. And then you've got to communicate it like over and over and over again. So it is, it's up in our walls everywhere. It's in every meeting. It's in all our documents. It's, it's one of those things that you need to kind of fully consume because it's, it's such an important part of building a great team that it just needs to be everything. Yeah, and I, I love that you're so openly sharing and I think it's really important and not enough people share the work in progress, you know, and just knowing and just admitting and just being okay with the fact that you've made mistakes. So maybe you can even share with us a couple of the big mistakes and the biggest learning curves that you've had. One of the things is, you know, the right people. 
Um, you've got to get the right people. People are everything. And especially when you're a fast growth startup, there is so, there's so much pressure to get it right, but yet you've got to employ so fast. Mm. So, you know, there's this thing where I always, in my mind, what I'm thinking about is you've got to hire fast enough to not slow down the business, slow enough to not fuck it up. And when you do fuck it up, fix it as soon as you can. Try and make sure you get the right people. And that means processes into hiring, make it hard to get a job, meet with multiple people, um, different team leads, other people within the team, Andre and I as founders, just because you want different opinions as to how that person fits within the, the team. The second one is just do not, do not, um, do not make the mistake of taking the easy path in that if you don't find the right person in the 50 that you've just gone through, start again. Because mm -hmm. if you get the wrong person, which is point three, um, they can rot a culture so quickly and you need to get rid of them as soon as you can. Yeah, and so further than being just an amazing wine platform with amazing deals and awesome producers and even better community, you also have a social heart with your Wine for Good program. So maybe yes. you can share a little bit about that and how it started and what you guys, what kind of projects you're working on. Part of our mission was, uh, part of it, it was to um, uh, be proud of what we do and our impact on the world. So that kind of was the start and the birth of what something that we call Wine for Good. And so Wine for Good is just basically an umbrella for all the, all the social things that we get involved with. And I think the first thing we ever did, which was really beautiful, um, we wanted to recognise the people behind, um, behind the, the, the organisations and the charities that are actually doing the good work that don't normally get recognised. So the first thing we organised was something called the Vino Bomb. And the Vino Bomb was basically this surprise um, wooden case with like wine in it, six wines in it, and a whole bunch of partners that had donated like services, cards, credits, whatever, and our community would vote, um, put names on, randomly weren't supposed to tell the people that they voted for, like just kind of go this person for a little bit of reason on our social pages. Um, uh, our head of social, Rosa, would go through all the nominations and choose maybe 10 or 20 to go and dive into more deeply, find out what they did, um, and then would surprise anywhere from one to 20 people with these boxes so we and we'd take our team out there to deliver it so these people that never get any recognition but are doing amazing work would be um vino bond the more, more recent one um started uh three years ago and it's called the homeless scraps project and it kind of ties in to the doing some good but also sustainability stuff a friend of ours in the wine industry was a grape grower there was a block that he wasn't going to pick um one year like three years ago He's just a shout out on Facebook um, back then, just going, hey, I've got a part of this block, I'm just not gonna get to it. It's been, it's been a big year for um, the crops and they're just gonna basically drop, die, drop on the vines. They're really great grapes. Um, and so if anyone wants to use them for any reason, then just get in touch. And my co-founder, Andre, um, saw the post. He's like, what about if we did something special? So we basically had our community pick the grapes that were going to go to waste. Um, we had uh, our uh, friends make the wine, then we had friends bottle the wine, and then Vino Mofo took it. We created the label, which is beautifully designed by Art Director, uh, and then we um, sold it through Vino Mofo. And no one, the whole way through, took any money for anything they did. And so every single dollar went to um, the Hart Street um, Centre, which is like a homeless, um, homeless organisation to help homeless. And so that first year, I think we raised just under $40,000 uh, wow. with it, just a Facebook post. Yeah. You know? And then the next year doubled and then the year after that, which is this year, um, is going to be much, much bigger. So what are some little green steps that our audience could take to be a bit more mindful um, and conscious of their wine choices? I look for small batch, interesting biodynamic wines. Mm -hmm. It's good, good for the earth, good for, good for you. Support local. Um, there's a lot of, you know, a lot, a lot of in uh, Australia, we've got a lot of like local producers and it's rather than kind of focusing on too much imports, it's a bit harder in Singapore, obviously. Support your small and independent guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who actually do some good for the world with the money that they raise. Well, Justin, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for watching. I hope you learned something today so that you can live more consciously tomorrow. And if you're looking for more inspiration, you can head over to www.greenisthenewblack.asia.